Smart speaker ownership has more than tripled in the last two years. Hey, I'm super excited to introduce this video. It's with Crockett Dunn, a big part of the technology and startups growth network. He's been with us before. And we're going to hear him tap into two things. The first is, well, just what he's talking about, which is how to use Alexa voice skills um, to get on the ground floor of what might be a new sales channel for you. And the second thing that might not be as obvious but you can listen for is how a futurist, a technologist like Crockett, looks ahead in time, discovers what the ground floor is, what are the opportunities that you don't want to miss. So listen for that as well. Hey, you have done it again. You found Tech and Startups, the number one place for all technology leaders, whether you're a founder, CEO, or a CTO. This is the spot for you. So if you haven't been here before, go ahead and like this video. Subscribe to the channel so that the updates appear in your feed. And we'd love it if you dropped in a comment about your thoughts about what you're about to see. Okay, we're jumping back in with Crockett Dunn, who's going to talk to us about Alexa and voice tech as a sales channel. Crockett, are you ready? So I'll do a bit of a walkthrough first, and then Alex, in case I get derailed, I'm counting on you to, uh, to bring me back in because I like, I like my digressions and tangents because I love, I'm here for you. This, and I love this stuff. A voice user interface, uh, VUI, or some people just call it voice refers to uh, everything from saying, okay, Google, hey, Google, to uh, Alexa, to Siri, even Bixby. No, all my devices are all answering me, which is good fun. So this is a, it's voice search, it's virtual assistants, and it's smart speakers. Um, the way I'm going to structure this is I'll talk a little bit about um, where we have come, in terms of voice user interface, where we are now and where we are going. All right, so um, one of the points I'll make is about the, the inevitability of widespread adoption of voice user interface. And I'll show you a couple little graphs about the pace of change of uh, supporting technology and the adoption rates of voice technology. And what you'll see is the uh, the rate of change, the number of people that have Alexa devices or similar um, is accelerating even faster than some metrics of the World Wide Web in the mid-90s, which is huge. Um, let's see. Let's see. This is where I just make the case that um, we forget that voice is really the original human interface. You know, uh, should go without saying that's how we talk to each other and if it weren't for 25 plus years of crappy ability to talk to devices like computers with sort of halfway voice interface or cars where you were supposed to be able to talk to them but they would never do what you want we would think it was obvious it's supposed to work like it does in the science fiction movies star trek and it hasn't but it can now and it will so that and that's what i'm really excited about um, let's see. I think I'll get back to this when I talk about how technologies come into their own from first, there's usually a messy, well, I'll just give you a preview. First, there's usually a messy cluttery phase. Um, and I'll go ahead and do the full digression. Okay. So, uh, there's this concept of when a new communications medium comes out like let's say uh, radio, uh, no video, that we just put old stuff on the new medium. An example would be uh, when video came out, we were just filming radio shows before we said, oh, we can take the cameras out into the world and film cool stuff. And um, when the World Wide Web was new, we just put text just top-down text and like the most interactivity was you can link one piece of text to another piece of text so voice is on the way to coming into its own um to give you one more analog when cars were first invented we called we called them horseless carriages because we didn't have the new paradigm of what an automobile really was you know, we're still thinking like we're riding behind a horse in this carriage, but the horse is gone. So what? 
so we're we're still in the horseless carriage phase with voice user interface and my point is to not let that distract from the fact that this is going to be the primary way that people connect to their devices and inquire of their devices and request stuff they want stuff they want to pay money for from their devices and they want it eventually they won't even think about a device it's just sort of a thought to a word to do my bidding or fulfill my request um, so sometimes I go in onto this tangent about why is no one excited about voice user interface and I, my answer is that we've been numbed by 25 years of false promises and I have some cute examples like going backwards in time uh, some smart TVs that you were supposed to be able to talk to that you could kind of talk to here's one uh, going farther back it gets more interesting interesting um, talking to your car kind of worked also but uh, not everyone remembers as far back as 1993 you you could talk to your Macintosh computers um, and then this is my favorite 1984 there was a remote control robot and this is a wired remote control not wireless remote control wired remote because we differentiated those back then that you could voice command to turn left turn right and walk and uh, this little guy burbot i think he's awesome i think it's hilarious um but there's a reason there have been there's been all these false starts from silly things like this to big money, Apple, Microsoft, Samsung, everybody trying to get behind it. And again, it is the inevitability of this and the power of it because the power is, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, the power is reducing the friction between um, user's desire and the fulfillment of the desire. These are the pictures I use to make the case for um, the accelerated, the rapid adoption. So I'm going super fast because I knew I had more than I had time for. So I hope I'm not totally confusing people. But so I started looking at internet adoption numbers I think this is a good speed keep going yeah thank you for yeah. the encouragement it's tough you know with no uh, I know there's yeah. no one in the room with you it's hard virtual conferences but you it's great because you know, we get to meet you across the world that topic is like the foundation of an essay I read today that I will not talk about until later because it's too interesting to stop <laughs> okay um, so I looked at the um, percentage of internet users in the world uh, and, and sort of the doubling every year. And that, that's a pretty good comparison. Um, smart speakers do something similar. It's not quite doubling. So it's tough to get data before 2000 for internet things, but I found one that really matches, that might be a good comparison. Um, this is the percentage of US adults owning a smart speaker. Um, and it's, you can see the rate, it's doubling and one and a halfing roughly. I found um, this stat of users with broadband and uh, the percent of the population with broadband in the US in 2002, to th it took from 2002 to 2008, uh, six years basically, to have similar adoption to what we saw in two years for smart speakers. The point is, it's it's exploding. There it is. There's the point. Explosive growth. Okay, so now that I covered all that background. Let me get into the specific application. Um, I said this before, the, the value of the voice as a user interface and the reason, frankly, Amazon 
even cares about voice user interface is it removes the friction between a customer's desire and fulfillment of that desire. Um, it's the closest thing Amazon can have right now to me thinking my back itches and automatically having a back scratcher show up at my front door. You know, they want people to think it, buy it, think it, buy it. So um, that's powerful. Um, sticking to the uh, title of my talk. So I'm a little conflicted because we're on this cusp in terms of adoption and, and this, I'm about to mix metaphors, this horseless carriage of voice user interface finding its voice, coming into its own. So the uh, sales channels, the, the value, it's different for different industries. Um, you can do direct sales through Amazon. Um, there's freemium models where you can, uh, for one, one company I worked with, uh, Brain FM, they let you listen to a, a few free tracks of their focus-inducing brainwave entrainment uh, before subscribing. Uh, similar to relaxation sounds, they also have the few free samples, subscribe for added features and more content. And of course, uh, brand marketing. That is my son. Asher, could you uh, hold it down in the background? Go along the lines of coming into its own, finding its voice, uh, the company's really doing more than just kind of awkwardly cramming their old content onto a voice model. Uh, Domino's Pizza is an interesting example. They have an entire um, order status tracker, and uh, you can build a pizza profile online and then just command your device to bring you the pizza of your choosing um, uber lyft starbucks grubhub they're doing similar things uh, banks are allowing you to do balance inquiries um, so those are the the companies that are really using it beginning to use it for the unique value you get from voice um, there's more value offered by indirect sales. Um, Campbell's Soup has something really cool that lets you plan your meals and pick the ingredients. Um, I think there's some similar stuff with, uh, I can't remember, but the Thanksgiving turkey brand did something similar. They won a contest for some recipe planner. Let's see. I kind of uh, already made the points. Uh, I just wanted to credit this guy. I, I read this essay in 1996 from this agency that was that did all these really awesome websites in 1996, like Wells Fargo lands in, and it, it it's the essay that gave me the ideas about um, new technology uh, finding its voice coming into its own, with the examples of people pointing the video cameras at the radio show and just filming the radio show people sitting and talking before they really figured out what to do with it. So that's, that's my shout out to uh, Tim Smith. I think he's big shot VC guy in San Francisco now, but he used to be a programmer just like me. Um, That is it. I think I'm going to pass it back to Alex to uh, ask me questions or Q&A. Now here's a riddle for you. What does Tesla's founder president and Groupon's founding CEO have in common? They were both removed from the companies they started. Stay with me for another, I don't know, minute and understand this. More than three out of four founders are ousted from their role before year five. That's before IPO, before acquisition, before wild adoption. And as a result, you leave potentially millions of dollars on the table for your successor to pick up. But that won't be you, right? Imagine how good it will feel to carry out your vision for your org as a leader for years to come. Are you a founder of a software startup with a live product and a team? 
If so, can you see yourself learning to grow alongside your company? I've been working with founders and Fortune 100 companies for a decade, and I have a gift for you. It's free. It's a webinar, and it explains why CEOs and other founders are essentially removed from your company and what you need to do to stay. Move now. Click the link in the description to transform from a founder CEO to a growth CEO, to scale your org, keep your money, and have a worldwide impact. The link to the free webinar is in the description, and I'll see you on the other side. I'm so glad you joined us today. If this video was helpful, give it a like. Go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell so that tech and startup videos continue to show up in your feed. I'll see you in the other videos.